Well, hey, like Justin said, uh, my name is Alan Seaborn from Winning at Home. And if you've been here over the summer, I was here a few times. I'm excited to be back with you this morning. And as we're transitioning, getting into kind of the cold weather part of the year, I was thinking back on something that happened to me about 10 years ago when I was in college. I went to a school down a little, about an hour north of Indianapolis. It was in a town called Marion, Indiana. And they're not used to getting snow like we're used to getting here. Here, you know, a foot of snow is like, shoot, it's a regular Tuesday, but I wish I didn't have to move this much snow. While I was down there, we got about eight inches of snow, and the mayor declared a state of emergency. <laughs> they made it illegal to drive if you were going anywhere other than work or the hospital. All right, they were freaking out about this eight inches of snow. And I didn't plan on sharing this, but I told first service, so I'm gonna tell you too. I had a little Ford Escort and I got some of my roommates that were from Indiana. I'm like, guys, let me show you how to drive in. It's not a big deal. So we drove around a little and didn't get a ticket, which was nice. But what happened is they panicked so much that for the first time in my college's history, they canceled classes for three days in a row because of this snow. They just did not know what to do. So you can imagine a bunch of 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds with three days of nothing to do trapped on campus that things kind of got out of hand a little bit in a couple ways. And so how that happened around our place, I lived in an apartment on campus and I think there were eight of us living in this little uh, apartment. And we woke up, I think it was day two of the, the snow that they were just freaking out about. And I don't remember the first guy that was ready to leave, but he opened the door and our door opened inward and someone had buried our entire door. All you could see was just a wall of snow. <laughs> and so to even get out of our apartment, this guy, which he looked like he kind of had fun with it, he was running up like how you would like shoulder into a door and he busted through it and we shovel it all out. And we're laughing, going, man, I wonder who got us. Ha ha, good, good prank, you know, some friends of ours. Well, we found out that the guy that did it was actually a guy that we didn't really know. And so it felt a little different all of a sudden. It went from like, oh, ha ha, someone that we really like got us to like, what? No, what's the deal with this? Why is he messing with us? We don't even know who this guy is. So when you have eight, 19, 20 year old guys that have nothing to do. You really don't want to start this kind of thing. <laughs> and we sat and we came up with a plan. And so our first step of our plan, we found this guy's car out in the parking lot. We found out which car was his. And then I still can't believe we did this because it's just so nasty, but we had a 55 gallon trash can in our apartment. We sit this thing in our shower and filled it full of water. It took probably 10 minutes to get this thing full of water. And we dragged it out to his car. We dumped, with three of us lifting it, we dumped it over his car, paying special attention to the locks and the door handles and everything. <laughs> we really made sure that he was not going to do this again. So then we took this back inside, filled it again, while we buried the car in snow. So we got a nice, you know, foot, foot and a half of snow by the time this thing was ready. We dumped it on top of it again so there would be a nice ice, snow, ice layer. And then we just kept burying, kept burying. And this was like around the time when, I, I don't remember, I had a flip phone. It wasn't a smartphone. So it was kind of right at the beginning of when pictures were getting put on Facebook a lot. And so I know we took a picture of this guy's car, but I cannot find it. It was piled, buried under snow, this tall. The cars next to him were some collateral damage, as you can imagine. It was unfortunate. They were mostly buried too. And then we sat in our apartment. We could see this guy, well, where his car was. We could see from our apartment, and we just watched. And we watched when he came out, and he figured out. I guess he was like, well, I remember I parked somewhere here. Okay, so he figured out it was his car. And he grabbed a few people, people we assume were in on burying our door in the first place that are out there helping him. But remember, they're not really used to a lot of snow. So one guy, he had a metal tip shovel, all right? And he climbed on top of this car 
and he was smashing down on top of it with a metal tip shovel. And as you can imagine, he busted the back window, and then we all got dragged in front of, forget the title of this guy, I remember the guy, if he was like the academic dean or like the student dean, I don't remember. And he's like, yeah, you guys are gonna pay for this. And we're like, what? He goes, well, if you never would have buried his car, then none of this would have happened. And we're like, right. And if he never buried our door, none of that would have happened either. Come on. And now I look back on it like, obviously, he was right. We should have had to pay for it. But uh, in the moment, I was very, like, one of my roommates was like, I, my dad's a lawyer, and we're going to, I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, so, because 70, 80 bucks a piece divided up to pay for that thing for broke college kids who are working jobs to pay for our books, like, that's a big deal. But they said they wouldn't let us graduate if we didn't pay it. So, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> so we pay for this thing. And now I think back on that story. And it's funny, right? Because it's not a big deal. It's not something. But I also know that my motivation behind what I did, my part of this whole thing, was not, oh, ha, this is funny. This is a funny little prank war. My motivation is, okay, you're going to do this to me. I'm going to do this to you and try to make sure that you never do anything like this again. And we know how that stuff can spiral because it just goes boom, boom, boom. And next thing you know, you find yourself saying something. You find yourself doing something. And you're going, how did I get here? Because what it feels like in the moment is this slow progression of one-upping each other. Actually, when we step away from it, we realize that it's not going up. Uh, we're sinking below each other, below ourselves. And we're finding new depths of the things that we're willing to do to try to stop the hurt or to try to hurt somebody else. And we know when we're not in that moment, when I look back on that, I go, yeah, you know, it wasn't a big deal, but it, I didn't handle that the way that I probably should have handled it. And we all know that feeling, right? Of realizing, oh, shoot, I've gotten myself into this thing and it's not where I want to be. And then we see when we read scripture, like we will this morning from uh, John chapter 13, we're going to take a look at a moment in Jesus' life where we see the better way, where we see what he really is calling us to. And before we start reading those verses, I want to set the stage for what's happening here. Because John chapter 13, now because we know the whole story of Jesus' life, we call John chapter 13 the Last Supper. Because we know that after Jesus gathers with his disciples, he's eventually going to be betrayed, arrested, tortured, and murdered. But they didn't know that. You got to remember, the disciples, this was just unfolding for them like another day would unfold. And they were always traveling around with Jesus, and he was always teaching and preaching and healing and, and confronting and doing all the things that he normally did. And at the end of these days, when they're out on the road, they would stop somewhere and they would have something to eat. So they get to the spot where they're going to eat their meal. And John, who wrote this gospel, tells us that when they got to the place where they were going to have this meal, there was no servant that was greeting them at the door to wash their feet. Which we're like, okay, must be something I'm not getting because I'm going out to lunch after this and I'm not washing my feet and it doesn't really matter. But when you get what actually was happening we see the full scope of why this is in there. Because Jesus and his disciples had been traveling most of the day or all day on dirt roads, pathways that were just packed down by other people, other animals, carts rolling across these things, wearing sandals. So their feet have been sweating, they're coated in dirt. Best case scenario, their feet are nasty and sweaty and dirty but they're also sharing this road with animals and animals go to the bathroom wherever they're walking. So they maybe dodge some of that, but probably walk through some animal waste. 
if it's been raining at all, they're walking through this soup of mud and just nastiness. And you go, okay, yeah, their feet would have been pretty dirty, but still, okay, it doesn't seem like that huge of a deal. Well, we, we need to understand that they didn't sit at tables and chairs like we do. Their dinner tables would usually be about a foot, a foot and a half raised off the ground. And um, I realized this would probably block some people. So if you can imagine that the edge of this stage is the front of my little table that sits this high off the ground, they would lay like this and recline, and then the next person would recline right next to me. So my feet that are laying next to the table are this far away from the guy next to me's food. Now you see why it's a big deal. Now you see why no servant being there to wash feet is like, okay, we've got a dilemma because I'm not going to be able to eat while I'm smelling whatever is going on with this dude's feet next to me. And so John tells us that Jesus waited until partway through the meal and he got up and he found a bowl of water and a towel and he went around and he washed every one of his, his disciples' feet. And the reason, I think, that Jesus waited till partway through the meal is because he wanted to see if anyone else was going to do this. Because it's an obvious problem that obviously needs to be addressed. But nobody wanted to do it because the job of washing someone else's feet, as you can imagine, knowing how filthy they were, this is a job that would be done by the least important person in the room. This was a job that the lowest servant, this is like the intern or the person that just recently got hired, this is the thing they have to do that nobody wants to do. And everybody would have been willing to wash Jesus' feet, but they certainly, they're going, well, I'm more important than Andrew. He should be the one that's going around doing this, not me. And nobody does it until Jesus gets up partway through the meal. I was trying to think, okay, what would that be like? What sort of a job or what sort of a task would that look like today that we go, I'm not doing that? And I thought of times I stop at a gas station, I go into the bathroom, and a lot of times the paper towels are overflowing out of the garbage and people kind of, they just throw the towel over toward the garbage can, right? I don't bend down and pick those up and stuff them down in and go, oh, I've got to take care of this. I go, hey, they pay someone to do that and it's not me. I'm not messing with that, right? Even though that has been my job in the past, but I'm like, well, they're not paying me now, so I'm not doing it. That's what washing someone's feet would have been like. And so Jesus, who every one of these disciples left everything in life to follow, is now going around and washing his disciples' feet. And after he sits back down and they resume their meal, uh, that's where we're going to pick up reading in John chapter 13, verse 33. Jesus says, My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. Now, I want you to think for a moment. If you can imagine being there as Jesus is washing everyone's feet, how uncomfortable that would have been. And then he follows it up with saying, hey, I'm going somewhere and you don't, you don't get to go with me. Now imagine being one of his disciples in that moment because these were men who had left their jobs, they had left their families, they had left their homes to travel around and follow Jesus. They didn't have a plan B. They left everything to be a part of what he was doing. And now he's saying, hey, I'm going away, I'm going somewhere, and you, you don't get to come along with me. And I think that part of the reason that Jesus has these two jarring moments with his disciples, and he spends this time teaching right before he's betrayed and arrested and all the rest, I think it's because he wants them, as they think back on what it looked like to spend time with Jesus, 
to really dial in on what he says next. It's verse 34. He says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. What Jesus here is calling his disciples to, and by extension, what he invites all of us into, is to love people the way that Jesus did, to the point that people watch the way that we live our lives, and they think, man, the way they love people, the the only other person in human history that I've heard about who was this crazy about loving people was Jesus. Because you see, Jesus, he wasn't the only traveling teacher, a rabbi, who went from town to town and talked about the Old Testament and talked about what God wanted from his people. There were other rabbis that did this. And it would be obvious to know which rabbi someone followed because they all had their different ways of doing things. Some had a certain little catchphrase that they would say. If you heard someone say that, you go, okay, yeah, I know they follow this rabbi. Or they dress a certain way, or they were really strict about a certain thing. Kind of the way we do this today is the bumper stickers that we throw on our car to let people know what sports team we support. The flags we hang in front of our house, the music we have cranked as we're stopped at a stoplight. People know what we're about, right? from the way that we dress, from the things that we say, from all these things. And Jesus is saying, I don't want people to know that you follow me based on just some external bumper sticker, some music you listen to, something you're really strict about. He said, I want people to know that you follow me by the way that you love one another. That's what he invites us into. But I want to offer some clarity here for a moment because I think in the church we talk about love a lot. We talk about we're supposed to love God. That was, you know, when someone asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? He said, first, love God. Second, love people. We hear passages like this that we're supposed to love one another like Jesus loved us. And I think that we're in danger of almost becoming so familiar with hearing love, 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 love that it kind of goes in one ear and out the other. We go, yeah, 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 I know what that means. And I think sometimes uh, in West Michigan, we use a little shorthand for love, and we start to think that being passive or not wanting to rock the boat is what it means to be loving. What about um, someone, you're getting together with some friends, and you're getting ready to go out to eat, and someone goes, hey, where do you want to eat? And you go, okay, well, I don't want to bother anybody. I'm really hoping we get pizza because I really want to try this new place. And you go, oh, I don't care, wherever you want to go. And then they pick Chinese and you're like, oh, inside. You're like, I can't believe this. That We think that's love, right? Just go, well, I don't want to be selfish. You guys do whatever you want. I don't want to rock the boat. Just going to be passive. And in that little example, it's not a big deal. But when we start to actually do that in things in life that are significant, when the people around us are doing things that are hurting us or hurting themselves, um, love doesn't mean just going, hey, I don't want to rock the boat. You do whatever you want to do. We watch Jesus continually saying things that were true that the people around him weren't all that excited to hear him say. I want to talk about something, too, um, that I... God's been laying on my heart for probably the last nine or so months um, to share in the church about abuse because it's real life. It's happening around us, yeah, even in quiet little Zealand. And I want to talk for a moment about that. Um, So as I've been feeling like God's laying this on my heart to share, I was reading a book about people who have experienced trauma. This is a guy, he worked with uh, soldiers returning from Vietnam War, and he was dealing with them with their PTSD. And he also had some patients who uh, had been physically and sexually abused. And he saw the same traits in them 
that these soldiers were dealing with with their PTSD. And he started putting these patterns together and seeing the way that trauma impacts us. And I I want to give a moment, if anyone, I know a lot of the kids went to uh, shake out, but if you have your kids in here, I'm going to be reading a paragraph from this book. It's nothing explicit, but just to let you know. So this is the very first paragraph of this whole book. One does not have to be a combat soldier or visit a refugee camp in Syria or the Congo to encounter trauma. Trauma happens to us, our friends, our families, and our neighbors. Research by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has shown that one in five Americans was sexually molested as a child. One in four was beaten by a parent to the point of a mark being left on their body. And one in three couples engages in physical violence. A quarter of us grew up with alcoholic relatives and one out of eight witnessed their mother being beaten or hit. Um, I've read this paragraph a lot of times since the first time I came across it. And even reading it again now, it's heartbreaking to see the scope of abuse. How many people uh, have experienced this trauma inflicted on them by someone in their lives. And what I want to say really specifically, because often we see that people who are victims of abuse, uh, they say, well, I I really love this person, so I want to stay with them. I I really don't want to ruin their life and talk about this. I really don't want this to spiral out of control. Um, That's not what Jesus means when he says love one another. It doesn't mean just stay in this situation where you're experiencing abuse. It doesn't mean go back to the situation where you're going to continue to experience abuse. That's not love. Um, If you are in the midst of that, if that's your current reality, I would love to talk to you afterwards. Come find someone on staff at the church. Talk to a counselor down the road at Winning at Home. There's also Ottawa County has a a domestic violence um, unit specifically geared toward helping victims of abuse. Uh, The Center for Women in Transition in West Michigan also is a great resource. But if you're in the midst of that, if you're experiencing abuse, don't let yourself go, well, this is what I'm just supposed to do. I'm just supposed to suck it up and deal with this and take it. No, that's not what this is saying. And I also want to look at that from the other side for a moment. If we see how many people have experienced abuse, we realize how many people are inflicting that abuse on other people. And I want to just say for a moment, if you've heard me talk before, you know that I am not a make-you-feel-guilty, a judgmental, I'm not that person but I'm going to say this as clear as I can say it. If you're thinking back and you go, yeah, some of those things on that list, I've done that to somebody else. Whether it was 20 years ago or an hour ago this morning, however you've explained that away and justified it in your head and go, well, they deserve, this is how it escalated, they they were asking for it. That behavior is 100% the opposite of the way that Jesus calls us to live our lives. There's no way to reconcile that with saying that you want to follow Jesus. And I know that talking about this stuff is heavy, but it's real life. And if we can't talk about real life here in the church, um, then what are we doing? And so when Jesus talks about love, What is he talking about if if that's not what he's saying? Well, we watch time and time again. Jesus gives so much time and effort and energy. He sacrifices himself for the betterment of other people. And we watched him over and over, even though he was misunderstood, even though he was rejected, even though he was hated, 
he had every reason to just say, you know what, spending yourself on behalf of other people, this is just not worth it. These people aren't appreciative, they don't get it, I'm done. But that's not what love does. And so what Jesus is inviting all of us to this morning um, is to love one another. Now I'm guessing that as we've been looking at this passage and as I've been sharing this morning, that some of us are going, yeah, I, I came in here this morning knowing one thing specifically I need to do to be more loving, or maybe five things or ten things or whatever. Maybe it was in that moment where things are kind of getting out of hand, okay, I need to not say that. I need to not do that in that moment. Uh, but maybe you're also going, okay, I'm looking around our neighborhood and I'm seeing a couple, uh, a couple situations where I'm kind of feeling like God might be leading me to reach out to somebody or to get involved in their lives in a way that makes me a little bit uncomfortable, but it, it sure lines up with what Jesus teaches. Whether that means offering a safe space for somebody that needs a place to be safe for a day or a week or a month. Um, I, would, I would guess that just about as many different people of us are in here there are that many different ways that we're uniquely, uniquely equipped uh, to love people like Jesus did. And so I want to ask you to take a moment and join me and bow our heads um, and just listen to God for what it looks like for you to love. And as the band comes forward, uh, they're going to close us out with a song. I want to invite you to pray with me. God, this morning, um, we thank you that we can look at Jesus' life as an example. We can see the way that he lived, the way that he sacrificed what would have been easiest for him, what would have been most comfortable for him, God, and showed us what it looks like to give time and effort and energy for the sake of others, even when it's not appreciated, it's not valued, it's not even understood. God, we pray that you'll help us in the moments that we've been thinking about, these, these times where we know we could look more like you. Help us to be faithful and help us to do just that. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. And today as we go, may God fill us with his grace and his strength to go and love like Jesus. You're dismissed.